Galba with uh, uh, Professor of Political Science at uh, York University and with the Socialist Project and Center for Social Justice. We're hosting today's events. Today we're going to discuss the topic of Europe in a vortex of crisis, authoritarian neoliberalism, the advance of the far right and dilemmas of the left. Uh, just change the spatial location and it's the issues that we also face uh, here in uh, North America and in Toronto. A decade into the financial crisis, the fears that many of us had about the growth of the far right and the dilemmas of the left in, ad in, in addressing this have come to fr fruition. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, Trump is widening the space for the far right across North America. Clearly, uh, these developments are, are even more frightening in Europe where we have actual fascists in, in government in Hungary, Poland, Italy and a range of developments that are parallel uh, in, in representation and development of right-wing forces in, in Spain, uh, Germany, the UK, France under Macron, uh, and most surprisingly, in some ways, given the, uh, being the heart of, uh, of social democracy in several of the Nordic countries. Uh, but the crises that have been facing Europe aren't just limited to the, the far forces of the right. There's the dilemmas in and around uh, uh, the tariff wars, the migration flows, the issues of violence in the cities, uh, the incoherent, the continued incoherence of the governance structure and the macroeconomic policies of the European Union, uh, and so on. Uh, what's so important, I, I think, uh, about the French case is Macron and the, the way that the, the forces of the center left, or, or what were the center left, keep on opening space to the political right. Uh, these are uh, uh, really fundamentally important uh, features of the current period. I think we also need to keep in mind that of how they, they are part of authoritarian forms of governance that aren't being limited to Europe, North America, but are also spreading elsewhere. They're obviously the authoritarian government that exists under uh, uh, Xi Jinping in China, uh, the type of government and the opening, widening of spaces for fascism in India, uh, the developments in several uh, other uh, uh, countries in the Middle East and uh, in Africa, which are also widening the space for the far right. So I think these questions th that are being addressed that begin from Europe soon spread everywhere, and there's a question of, 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 of our politics everywhere of what to do in this new conjuncture. Uh, this is one element of the dilemmas of the left, how to confront and deal and suppress fascism and defeat it but also then the other dilemma of how to develop new political forces that are capable of, of challenging, not going beyond challenging the far right, the hard right, to challenging for governance again, uh, the way that uh, new electoral alliances are forming in some cases, and in particularly the dilemmas of form, finding new political vehicles. Um, we have three people here who have been uh, immersed in these debates and particularly have been in Europe over the last year a great deal studying the developments in Europe. Uh, we will begin with uh, Stefan Kipfer, who teaches and researches European politics and social theory in the Faculty of Environmental uh, Studies at York. Uh, he's been particularly uh, uh, focusing on France, but not just on France, some of the development of fascist forces across Europe. Well, I'm going to start uh, partly because I'm going to say a few more general things about the uh, European Union and uh, some of some crisis tendencies within the European Union, and then sort of address the question of how to think of how one may think about the relationship between those crisis tendencies in Europe and the far right in its various forms. So let me begin perhaps with a few basics about the European Union, uh, since we're at some distance from, from Europe here. Um, what is the European Union? I mean, uh, perhaps two things not to, not to do when thinking about the European Union is to, do, to, either, to see it either as simply a supranational uh, government, um, or even a, a state, a full complete state, or to see it on the other hand a mere um, forum for member states. Right? Um, the European Union is neither one nor the other. It is a novel uh, political formation, a hybrid political formation, which has a number of quasi-state elements that go much beyond an intergovernmental organization, but of course it's also not uh, an integrated state, um, at least not yet. 
Um, so I'm following here roughly sort of the analysis that has come out of Germany, uh, Staatsprojekte Europa, uh, Europa, which uh, was represented here about a year ago in a similar forum. Um, so there are just elements of a, a state uh, of a European state that do exist now, partly through the European Commission, the, bu the bureaucracy, through elements of territorial organization, border control, uh, elements of citizenship, um, and of course also elements of, uh, of uh, monetary and um, um, uh, financial policy at the European scale. Now, secondly, if, if the European Union is best understood as a new sort of a hybrid form of, of, of non-state, quasi-state, how should we understand the dynamics of European integration? And here, historically, there have been two very influential uh, interpretations, uh, particularly before the crisis in 2008-9-10. Uh, one interpreted inter European integration as uh, the result of an elite project, uh, the result of an integrated project of capitalist uh, elites tied to transnational corporations, organized through lobby organizations and so on. And uh, the other interpretation that has been more mainstream has been the interpretation of seeing the European Union as a, as, a, as a kind of an institutional space that kind of propels itself, that integrates itself functionally, where institutional dynamics perpetuate themselves and, and create a dynamic of further integration uh, in a functionalist kind of way. Um, I think both of these interpretations are uh, one-sided and limited in various ways, and I think we've, we see this much more now than we used to, 10 years ago, I think, uh, precisely because of the crisis tendencies that I'll mention in a minute. In a minute. Uh, it is true that the European Union is, has become a site of organizing class rule at a transnational level over the last generation, since the late 80s, early 90s, uh, through the European Central Bank, through the various treaties of that time, the Schengen Treaty, the uh, Maastricht Treaty, and the uh, development of European-wide convergence criteria. Um, so Europe, Europe has become a strategic site for organizing transnational capitalist rule in Europe, for sure, and that's still the case today. Um, and it's important to point out, of course, that that rule has distinct neo-colonial dimensions, which uh, Statis Kubelakis very nicely outlined in the recent piece in the New Left Review, you should all read it, it's a very nice piece, it clearly outlines the, the, sort of the two neo-colonial di dynamics of, of, of uh, the European integration project, one having to do with the relationship between the core of the European Union and the European South, the Southern Europe, and the other one having to do with the relationship between Europe and non-Europe uh, through migration policy. Um, now, of course, however, uh, if it's true that Europe is uh, become a site of organizing transnational class rule, uh, that project is a project, it's an ongoing project, and it's a project that is shot through with various contradictions, uh, which again have, been much, much, have been, become much more evident uh, over the last uh, 10 years, although they've already, they were already there before. So let me just cite, uh, sort of mention three sort of sites of contradiction and crisis. One um, has, of course, to do with the dynamics of capitalist development. Um, the European Union for a long time has uh, economically both led to dynamics of integration but also uh, dynamics of increased uneven development. Uh, it has created new peripheries um, and re-peripheralized uh, previous peripheries. Right? So the crisis of debt management over the last 10 years since 2008 that was particularly harsh in Greece but also uh, struck very hard Italy and Portugal and Spain um, is one such example where the centers of European power in Germany and uh, parts of the northwest of, of Europe have, have created, re-peripheralized a part of France. And of course then we have the Eastern Europe, right? The integration of, of Eastern Europe which has uh, the countries of the former East Bloc, which have become a, a new periphery of a certain kind, uh, both a source of, of labor migration to the West, but also a source of capital export uh, for um, European multinational capital. And this kind of uneven development, of course, is, is a highly crisis uh, uh, 
uh, crisis oriented as we as we know now with with respect to the uh, uh, debt crisis uh, sovereign debt crisis that has been going on now for the last 10 years and that uh, has led to new forms of transnational um, uh, to, an, to a new transnational a uh, new colonial form of debt enforcement uh, across across Europe now the second set of uh, crises has to do with more the institutional arrangements of Europe itself. And I think here it's important to realize, and Brexit of course is just the, kind of the most obvious manifestation of it, but it's important to realize that Europe had always, the European Union has had centrifugal tendencies built into itself for a long time. And to some extent the expansion of Europe into Eastern Europe after uh, the fall of the East Bloc was partly designed to build a, a centrifugal counterpoint to um, voices for a social Europe coming out of uh, existing of the existing European Union, and also uh, a counter wage to dynamics of further integration, uh, particularly in France and Germany. And these centrifugal tendencies have now kind of broken open over the last ten years. Uh, Brexit being the most obvious example, but the alliance of Eastern European states that that hang together under, under the so-called Visegrad uh, alliance uh, has become an actual force that questions key elements of European integration, notably on migration, but also on elements of human rights and jurisprudence uh, uh, at the European scale. Uh, the third uh, level of contradiction really has to do with sort of the imperial and semi-imperial dynamics of European integration. I um, mean, in Europe is the European Union has always been part and parcel of an Atlantic uh, imperial uh, set of relationships. But within that context, particularly the French uh, military industrial complex has been pushing for a more autonomous security and military uh, strategy coming out of Europe. And that strategy has, of course, now uh, uh, again reached a number of limits uh, given the conflicts between Trump and selective conflicts between uh, Trump's U the United States on the one hand and Russia on the other hand, within which uh, um, uh, further European integration on these lines uh, it has become um, uh, more difficult. Uh, the other side of the imperial uh, dynamics of integration, of course, has to do with the refugee and migration regime that was set up in Europe over, over the last generation. Um, in Europe and here, a lot of people talk about the so-called refugee or migrant crisis. There is really no refugee migrant crisis in Europe. What there is, is a crisis of the refugee migrant control system, uh, which is under attack both from the far right, which wants to partly renationalize elements of, of the uh, European uh, border control system, and it's partly also itself in, in an internal crisis in terms of its capacity to, to uphold uh, the various layers, complicated layers of citizenship and, and uh, migration and refugee uh, management. Um, so these are, give you a bit of a sense of sort of the, the three sources of crisis today in Europe. And so the question arises, well, how do we think about the far right in that context? So just to briefly kind of return to Greg's introduction, um, the far right, which has a number of components, there's a populist, right populist component, and there's a a growing explicitly fascist or neo-fascist component in various parts of Europe. Uh, these components have progressed quite uh, significantly in a qualitative fashion over the last 10 years, both with respect to taking state power, or part of state power, as Greg mentioned, in Italy, in Austria, in, in Poland, in Hungary, and also at a subnational level, at various municipal scales in different countries, France, for example, which is what I'm looking, for, looking at most, most prominently. And uh, these uh, electoral governmental victories of the far right have also now squeezed the regular bourgeois right in a way as yet unseen. Um, the regular sort of conventional bourgeois right now increasingly faces the question what to do. Uh, should they join explicitly alliances with the far right, which is happening in various parts, uh, or should they try to hold on to some semblance of centrism, um, central, central right, uh, right centrism, I should say. Uh, 
And uh, that, that uh, prospect is clearly an indication that the far right has the momentum in terms of the political dynamics of, on the right and, and, and the center itself. Now, on the ground, however, and I'd like to add this to, to, the, to the situation, there's also a new set of developments in terms of uh, on-the-ground fascist politics. Uh, in a complicated way, we have, from the Ukraine to Poland to Hungary to Italy in particular, also to Germany in part, a new level of physical fascist politics, street politics, uh, which at its edge has, in some cases, also a terrorist component, France. Uh, Germany and a few other cases, so that that's not new, but there's an, a resurgence of some of that kind of politics. Um, there is also a new social social movement element of the far right, particularly in Italy and France. The so-called identitarian turn has produced a whole new generation of, of far right uh, youth that have are in the process of creating a new infrastructure, movement infrastructure for the far right social centers, in some cases imitating the left and anarchist left's tactics. So there's a, there's a whole new level of development on that le uh, at, that, at that scale also. So let me just finish briefly about how to think about this resurgence. Uh, I think it would be a mistake, and this is sort of my main point, it would be a mistake to see this resurgence simply as a reaction to the globalist, neoliberal, cosmopolitan ruling circles uh, that have, of course, have been very influential in the European project. Uh, it is also, would also be wrong to say that the resurgence of the far right is simply a, a passive benefactor of the contradictions that I just outlined. I think various components of the far right are not only active elements in producing those contradictions, but various elements of the far right have been part and parcel of various European-wide projects for a long time. So I'll give you a bit of a sense of this uh, historically. So a certain element of the fascist, the new fascist far right, and only an element, it's never been the, the, the whole spectrum, uh, has pursued a European-wide uh, alternative to European integration for the last 60, 70 years. Uh, so there's been a particularly Europeanist civilizational current of, of the far right, even when the far right was very marginal uh, in various parts of Europe. And that, that faction has become more and more dominant over the last uh, generation, partly because of the of Islamophobia, partly because of the rise of this idea that the main task is to, is to defend the West against the rest, refugees, migrants, and Islam, and all the rest of it. Uh, so that's that's a very that's a long-standing trend uh, in in that sense, and and that trend has had some role in building elements of the European project, not just now. Um, the other uh, thing to say is that various segments of the hard right, particularly the populist faction of the regular bourgeois parties, and in some cases the new fascist parties, like in France, have played a very active role, and in some cases a decisive role, in developing the neoliberal project from the beginning. Right, that's true in Austria. It's true less so, uh, but to, to a lesser extent in Germany. It's certainly true in Italy. Berlusconi, for example, the Freedom Party in Austria. It's, it's true at a secondary level in France, the Front National too. They, a lot of these parties have played an important role in creating, the, in helping to create the neoliberal project in, in, in different ways depending on the, on the context. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So the in that sense, it would be entirely wrong to see those forces as a, as a mere reaction to some non-far-right, liberal, progressive, multinational um, uh, integration project. As much as there are tensions, of course, between, between the far-right and Macron and, and um, elements of the center-left and the center-right. Um, today, the far-right really is proposed, is, it should be best understood as an international constellation. Right? It's not uh, a, a simple aggregation of nationalist parties in different, in different countries. It's an international constellation of politics, well-connected, uh, benefiting from a transnational dynamic, partly in for now, in today also partly a dynamic that is very actively enforced both by Trump's America and Putin's Russia. Right? So we're talking about a transnational phenomenon already, although there's nationalist elements to this. The phenomenon itself is a transnational phenomenon in a complicated fashion. And um, 
And uh, that international constellation now is at some level competing with the um, cosmopolitan globalist faction of capital, but at the same time also creating a dynamic of convergence, potential convergence, growing convergence, and we'll see how that's, uh, that's going to pan out. So in a year from now, year from now we have European elections and uh, today a lot of the public discourse is about sort of you know identifying two factions that the Macron faction of globalist capital trying to push integration further in various ways um, and on the other hand the Orban faction the faction defined by the the, uh, the head of uh, Hungary Viktor Orban the head of the Fidesz party, uh, which defines a kind of a Europe of nations of sorts as a, ca as a, as a counter proposal. Right? So superficially you can see very clear camps, but on the ground if you follow the politics of migration, the politics of anti-terrorism, the politics of security, you can see a whole, and, the, and also the politics of debt enforcement, uh, with respect particularly to the European South, you see a whole series of points of convergence between the far right and the center left and the center right. And those point of, point of convergence have something to do with what Greg said earlier, uh, state authoritarianism. Uh, you see, if you follow the refugee uh, politics and migrant politics today in Europe, you, you see there are points of divergence between the far right and, and more centrist parties, but beneath those points of divergence, there's all sorts of agreement about the basic principles of uh, building fortress Europe. Um, and the same is true uh, for questions of, of uh, anti-terrorism and security and security policy. So to conclude, uh, I don't have time to talk about the left, but it seems to me that if the far right and the center left, center right both propose different versions of a transnational international project, um, the left also needs to develop an international constellation of projects within which the national question, of course, is important, but that would be sort of my conclusion, uh, is that the fundamental task is to build a, a, you know, a third constellation of, of left and, and far left projects that can, can hold against European integration, not just at the national scale, but across national scales in various respects.